here in person. I'm glad that we're beginning to resume uh, discussions face to face like this after a couple of years of only looking at one another on screen. But for those of you who are on screen, we're delighted that you're joining us today for this session. Um, I'm the Executive Vice President of the National Bureau of Asian Research here in Seattle. Uh, we're an independent think tank with offices both here in Seattle and in Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome some of our D.C. colleagues here for this session today. Um, we're talking today about science and technology cooperation between the United States and the Republic of Korea. This is an issue that um, has, has long been part of the alliance relationship between the two countries. It's something that's been, been reaffirmed this past year as <laughs> President Biden and President Yoon have had several discussions and, and the importance of science and technology cooperation as part of the bilateral relationship. And so we've got a, a wonderful panel today that will discuss these issues and sort of look at how the two countries can continue to sort of further innovation. Uh, we have, um, you know, deep respect for one another. We have uh, systems of rules of law and the sort of economic ties that are deep and, and intertwined. And, and so there's a lot that, that the two allies can do together in this area. And we're, we're looking at an issue that's, I think, increasingly complicated as the world is beginning to split into uh, different ways of organizing economics, different ways of thinking about trade, massive pressures on supply chains, and, and massive instability as a result of war in Europe and geopolitical tensions across the Indo-Pacific region. So with that as sort of framing remarks, let me um, briefly uh, thank my colleagues uh, from the uh, NBR's Energy and Environment team for organizing this event. So Tom, Ashley Johnson, who runs that team, and then Chihiro and uh, Juliet and Mike are back in Washington, DC. And it's my pleasure now to, um, to introduce our, our uh, sort of welcome remarks speaker this morning, and that's Consul General Unji Seo from the Korean Consulate here in Seattle. Um, we've been delighted to get to know her uh, since March of 2022 when she arrived in Seattle. Um, she has a, a long and distinguished career as a diplomat with Korea's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, back to, to 1995, uh, various postings in Seoul, various postings overseas, including in San Francisco, Hanoi, and Geneva. Um, and most recently in Seoul, she was running uh, as Director General the Bureau of Public Diplomacy and Cultural Affairs for, for the government of Korea. So, um, Consul General Seo, we're delighted to have you here today. I'd like to turn the floor over to you for some opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, distinguished guests and panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is indeed a great pleasure and honor uh, for me to deliver my first speech here at the seminar co-hosted by the NBR and the Korean Council in Seattle today. Uh, in our present day, we live in a time where new discoveries and achievement, not advancement not only determine the competitiveness of companies, but also change people's lives and dictate the rise and fall of nations. As we face an era in which science and technology are reading the world, the solidarity between Korea and the United States is preparing a new chapter in science diplomacy by expanding cooperation related to innovation and cutting-edge technology. At the korea U.S. summit uh, in last May, the two countries agreed to strengthen cooperation in semiconductors, eco-friendly electric vehicle batteries, AI, quantum technology, biotechnology, as well as autonomous robot technology. As a practical measure to strengthen this agreement, the Republic of Korea decided to directly participate in the Artemis project, a manned and loot exploration program of the United States, and have Korean companies invest in musical power and terra power in small, small modular reactor development project on, as an eco-friendly energy policy. This Northwest American region in particular is the best area for science and technology exchanges between the Republic of Korea and the United States. It is widely known that Microsoft, Amazon, Google Cloud, and global IT companies are located here. Not only that, Boeing's factories, which are leading the global aerospace industry and Blue Origin's headquarters all reside in Washington state. That is not to exclude this region's leading role in bio research as a home to the Pratt Hutchison Cancer Center. 
And standing with the world class universities, UDOC is the most important college for academic exchange in Korea. With the goal of science and technology diplomacy, the Korean Startup Center here in Seattle, otherwise known as the KSC, is a valuable resource in pioneering Korea-US cooperation. The Korean government largely support the Korean startup companies using this avenue when entering the United States. As the KSC conduct market research and analysis in the US and support companies uh, with the legal advice. Furthermore, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Republic Korea realized the importance of a diversified and specialized science diplomacy is reviewing, establishing a science and technology cyber bureau to be in charge of advanced science, emerging technology, and cybersecurity affairs. According to each OECD country's evaluation, Korea science and technology innovation capacity is currently ranked seventh in the world. Starting with the, the semiconductor field, we possess world-class scientific and technological capabilities, such as energy, communication, IT, genetic engineering, and medical care systems. In addition, in June, we became the seventh country in the world to launch a practical satellite of one ton or more on a launch vehicle manufactured with Korea's own technology. Korea, which was once described as a land of money come, has now become one of the world leading countries in science and technology in the 21st century. Distinguished guests, as the competition between the two countries over science and technology is intensifying and the importance of international cooperation activities focusing on these areas is increasingly emphasized, a genuine technological alliance between Korea and the US is also urgently required. During this seminar, I hope that an abundance of good ideas on how to establish a science and technology diplomatic network between the Korea and the US will be formulated, and that this seminar will serve as a spark, spark to Tinder to promote friendship between Korea and the US in the future. Lastly, I'd like to thank the MBR officials who prepared this event and sincerely hope that this seminar will be a fruitful result and success. Thank you very much. Kamsamida. Thank you, Consul General Seo. Um, I'm going to turn back to my colleague Tom now to moderate the discussion. Um, my understanding is you have to leave us before the session is finished because you have another schedule. I do want to point out Dr. Lee from the Korean Consulate, who's the Science and Technology Specialist at the Korean Consulate. He'll be with us this morning, and so um, look forward to his contributions to the discussion as well. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Consul General Seo, for excellent welcoming remarks. Uh, I will not try and follow that um, because it was it was so well done. Um, I understand the consulate has a packed schedule, so we really appreciate you being here uh, to start us off with some of those thoughts on the importance of collaboration between our two countries. Um, as Michael mentioned, my name is Tom, and I'm very pleased and honored to be moderating our panel discussion this morning. Uh, we have an excellent group of speakers, and I won't keep you waiting to hear from them. But I wanted to provide just a few moments of context on the discussion today. Um, for the past year, NBR and the Energy and Environmental Affairs team has worked on specifically opportunities for collaboration to achieve net zero goals, um, which we have a special report out now um, from our opportunities on the US uh, Republic of Korea collaboration for net zero. We have some copies. I'd encourage you to uh, check that out online or here if you are so inclined. Um, and in the course of research and preparation for this, we worked with the consulate, and that was the beginning of this, uh, the, the seed that grew into today's event. Um, and at the excellent uh, behest and, and input from our colleagues at the consulate, today's event is designed to take a little bit of a step back from specifically focusing on climate change and ways for two key partners to work together on that, and taking a step back to focus on the importance of all science and technology diplomacy and opportunities to work between two close partners in the broader sense of them. So 
I'm very pleased to welcome our four panelists uh, today. We're going, uh, you have their bios with you in your materials or online. Um, and so without further ado, I'm first going to turn to Ms. Jennifer Audette of the Clean Tech Alliance to give a little bit of background on what Clean Tech Alliance does and where she fits and her organization fits in the ecosystem of startups and technology. Jennifer. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Jen Fraudet. I'm the Director of Programs and Communications at the Clean Tech Alliance here in Seattle. We are the largest clean technology trade association in the, in the United States with over 1,100 members um, across 17 states and four Canadian provinces. And if you, if you look at your uh, handout on your table, you'll get a little bit more of a visual of what our ecosystem looks like. But before I dive into more about the Clean Tech Alliance, I, I wanted to share that I'm coming today's discussion from a, a Western lens with, with a background in actually diplomacy. And prior to working for the Clean Tech Alliance, I worked for diplomatic arms of both the Canadian and German governments, covered Arctic policy for the Canadian government in Seattle, looked at really the implications and significance of climate change in the, the north where uh, the magnitude is, is three times, global warming is occurring three times faster the, than the global warming rate. And um, in New York City, worked for science, technology, diplomacy, arm of the government. And so while I have that Western lens, I think, um, you know, Within the last decade, the, the significance of the Asian economy um, and in the global economy it cannot be ignored. And so I'm excited to be here in today's discussion at looking at, um, you know, specifically the importance of having innovation ecosystems that are facilitated by groups like trade associations and how they can really serve as a nexus between academia, industry and government. And so a little bit about the Clean Tech Alliance. We are the nation's largest convener for climate tech, clean tech, clean energy, and the circular economy. And um, what we do is, is try to bring together players from a variety of uh, areas. So whether it be academia, like the UW Clean Energy Institute, or Washington State University, which is doing really um, advanced work in hydrogen research to the um, government players, which we, you know, international consulates, for example, um, and international trade and invest groups, whether it be Quebec trade and invest, invest in Alberta, et cetera. Those are groups that are members that, that have participated in, in events, whether it be sponsors or speaker opportunities. Then we bring in, you know, corporate private sector members um, across, you know, whether it be public utility work or, you know, looking at greening materials in the, in the built environment, companies like the Kings Green Vista, then continuing along that, that circle of, of partners, um, it would be remiss to not mention capital and the role of angel investing groups like E8 and, um, government funding, you know, funding coming from groups like the Washington State Department of Commerce, which has been very active with the Clean Energy Fund, for example. And, and then lastly, um, the startup ecosystem is key to our membership. And a lot of the programming we offer helps. Um, we, we have a Cascadia Clean Tech Accelerator program, and that helps these early stage startups connect them to mentors and um you know take them through a formal curriculum and, and help them also get um, connected and so it's easier to spin out and commercialize those innovations so that's a little bit of background of who's who's in our network you know who, who makes up the 1100 members and then i think um the second diagram i i had for the printout today is looking at um you, you know when we think about innovation and technology uh there's there's a lot of what what's called valleys of death where um from early stage university research to you know full scale adoption of technology there's a lot of places that um things can 
fail and, and not succeed. And, and a lot of that has to do with um, the amount of funding that's required um, in, in relation to the time that it takes to scale <coughs> technologies from early stage research. And so um, as a trade association, we look at offering programming that helps kind of bridge those respective values of death. So whether it be early stage mentoring and workforce development for students, uh, the tech transfer accelerator programs to help kind of move things from, from the lab lab to launch. We have a, a website that, that my colleague Rochelle has worked on. And then all the way through looking at advocacy and scaling and um, you know, providing a forum for networking. And so I think when we talk about science diplomacy and we and we talk about networks, um, you know, especially with this hybrid world, how, how are people forming connections? And are they forming connections they don't know they need to have? And I, I that's one of our things we like to talk about is often people join and, um, connections they make at networking events, they didn't know they needed, right? Um, oftentimes when you're working on a company idea, you might need someone two years down the line that that connection you've made uh, plays a key role. And then lastly, as we move through this, this valley of valleys of death to market validation and then adoption, and that's really where I come in as a director of programs events, um, especially for companies that want to launch and expand in the U.S. market, they need brand visibility. And so being able to serve on panels and or participate, you know, maybe as a presenting company an innovation showcase or um, have this really newsletter, these are all opportunities to be be on the radar screen in, in, in the U.S. And I think um, I think that's all I'll keep to my uh, eight, eight minutes of time here, but Ha, looking forward to discussing more, and I and I, you know, I think uh, in, in today's world, the the speed that we need to accelerate the decarbonization technologies requires all hands on deck. It's going to require bringing the brightest, most brilliant minds to the table, and that that really transcends boundaries. And so I think um, if we're looking at tackling climate change and reaching net zero goals, then we, we need to bring people together. And so with, with that, I'll hand it back to Tom to introduce the next panelist. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, I do want to come back to some of, the, some of your points, especially on this, this early stage transition from university research <clears throat> and also on making connections. But before we do that, um, I would like to move now to uh, Commissioner Sam Cho of the Port of Seattle, uh, who will be providing us with some of his experiences and remarks. So, Sam, over to you. Well, uh, thank you so much, Tom. I appreciate it. And thank, you. thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, my name is Sancho, Commissioner at the Port of Seattle. Um, and, you know, I actually wanted to start out with a bit of historical context. Uh, but I realized that this audience is probably a bunch of Korea uh, experts, because if you're getting up at 10 in the morning to join <laughs> on Monday morning to join us, uh, you probably have a deep interest or knowledge of Korea. Uh, but, you know, I actually come from a uh, foreign policy background. My first job out of grad school was working on the subcommittee on Asia, uh, Asia East Asia uh, in, on Capitol Hill for Congress and Ahmed Barra. And so this, I used to live and breathe this stuff in a prior life. Um, but from a historical context, as you all know, the genesis of the U.S. Korea relationship was birthed out of a, a, a traditionally military alliance, right? Uh, you all know the history of the U.S. intervening in the Korean War uh, and helping South Korea push back the North Korean invasion. Uh, and thereafter, American troops being stationed in Korea to help secure the peninsula against any future invasion. Uh, but I, I think inevitably, uh, you don't, you can't think about or talk about U.S.-Korea's economic relationship without really bringing in China, uh, especially in today's environment. Uh, Korea, for many years, has had the strategic position of what scholars characterize as a dual prong or dual approach when it comes to U.S. Uh, Korea economic relations uh, or just relations in general in China uh, because um, as a middle power they had to obviously respect and honor the history of the relationship with the United States but at the same time uh, couldn't ignore the growing power of China. Uh, in fact many economists and foreign policymakers feared that the growing economic interdependence between South Korea and China would hinder 
the U.S.-Korea's military alliance. Uh, so naturally, South Korea developed a strong relationship with China through trade, uh, while maintaining its bond with the United States as a military ally. And that's where the dual pronged strategic approach is kind of turned. Um, however, I think this dynamic has been shifting, um, and it actually has been shifting for many years. And that's why this conversation today around technology and energy is relevant. Um, and I'm going to touch briefly upon uh, uh, um, and remind you of an incident many years ago that I think illustrates kind of what's happening. If you remember, remember back in 2013, South Korea had inquired to the U.S. Department of Defense about uh, the THAAD technology, the Terminal High Altitude Defense System. Uh, and the issue of THAAD deployment became a huge topic of debate in Korea. It was a huge presidential topic debate back in the day. And the reason it became such a big issue is because it, this really tested South Korea's two-pronged strategy. Uh, and it put its feet to the fire when it came to the relationship between the United States and China. Uh, because China was the country that actually put up the biggest fuss over that. Uh, they were concerned about their own security uh, and the implications of having an air de missile defense system. Uh, and it was China who retaliated against South Korea uh, for the THAAD system, not militarily, but economically. And uh, I actually thought uh, uh, that the, this is very um, ironic that we are here at the Lotte Hotel because, in fact, it was Lotte and the ownership of this hotel who had, who were one of the biggest victims of those economic controversy over THAAD through those economic sessions. And so the push and pull between these three countries will inevitably continue. Um, and if you fast forward to today, 2022, I think that the COVID-19 pandemic has actually done a lot to disrupt and expose the U.S. economic uh, security. Uh, that's actually the buzzword of the Biden administration these days. It's, it's, you know, you hear national security all the time, but economic security is the term that a lot of, uh, uh, of security advisors in the Biden administration are using. Uh, I often say that COVID-19 has been a black light on our society. Right, and if you know what a black light is, it's it's a it's a light that when you shine on things, you see all the gross and nasty things that you don't see normally, but the black light exposes it, right? Uh, and I feel like that's exactly what COVID nineteen has done, and it has exposed tremendous vulnerabilities in the U.S. U.S. supply chain. Just think about uh, the major chip shortage we experienced during the supply chain. Think about the fact that South Korea is one of the biggest manufacturers of EV batteries. Um, Think about the fact that the Inflation Reduction Act has become a huge point of contention and debate because of the Made America uh, provisions that have hurt Hyundai's uh, competitiveness in the EV market, despite them being the second uh, highest market share in the country when it comes to EVs after Tesla. And so I think this pandemic has pushed us to strengthen our ties and accelerate the need to grow the economic relation between the US and South Korea. Um, and and uh, I realized that I was actually here not as a foreign policy scholar, but I'm here to talk about the port's role in all this. And so let me just say that the port of Seattle's relationship with South Korea is not only critically important to our success uh, as a port and as a region, but it's also growing, uh, especially as I work to add new lines of businesses with Korean companies to strengthen the two regions' ties. For instance, last month, we celebrated the arrival of the first Hyundai automobiles from the, through the Northwest Seaport Alliance Gateway. Uh, Consul General Sell was there for, uh, with us to celebrate that. I was happy to participate in the negotiation talks uh, to get the Grand Mercury vessel delivering 2,000 Hyundai vehicles uh, to this gateway. The, uh, Globus America has officially committed to consolidate their import and processing operations here at our gateway. They normally import their uh, Hyundai vehicles to the Port of Portland and we were able to win that business back. And so now the West, all West Coast Hyundais are imported through our gateway uh, that are Hyundai and Kia, very proud of that. Uh, last month, the Port of Seattle rolled out a partnership with the U.S. Small Business Administration, the Washington State Department of Commerce, Greater Seattle Partners, and uh, the Korean tech company, Coupon, uh, in the recent Small Business Growth Resiliency through Exports Opportunity uh, in U.S. Korean trade. And then uh, this event was actually conceived uh, between us and US SBA to boost exporting strategies uh, between small businesses within the Korean diaspora community. And it's a first step in exploring the potential of e-commerce uh, between South Korea and the United States 
uh, between, uh, you know, for small businesses and criminal businesses here. Uh, as Consul General message, mentioned here in Seattle, we also have a Korean Startup Center, uh, a center that is run by a Korean government agency uh, called Kosame, where we help, uh, where they help bring Korean startups to the market here in the U.S. Uh, and the Port of Seattle is actually uh, has a startup accelerator of our own. Uh, we co-founded called the Maritime Blue Accelerator. Uh, and this accelerator helps startups in the innovation of maritime and uh, sustainability go to market. And so I'm really, really happy to report that Maritime Blue, our accelerator, and Cosme uh, have reached an agreement to bring the first group of Korean startups into their maritime innovation accelerator cohort starting next year. So we're working a lot on innovation. Um, and lastly, obviously, the Port of Seattle has a huge stake in our supply chain. Uh, as the fourth largest container port terminal in the country uh, and the closest port uh, on the west coast to South Korea. Uh, we are so excited to see that relationship grow. And obviously, South Korea is doing so much when it comes to innovation and sustainability uh, as well. Uh, I will actually be going to COP27 in Egypt in two, in two weeks. And I will actually be, you guys are getting a, a sneak peek of what we'll be doing there, but we're actually going to be able to announce uh, a study in partnership with the Department of State and the U.S. Department of Energy on a green corridor between the Port of Seattle and the Port of Busan. Um, so very, very excited to be announcing that initiative, initiative at COP27. Uh, I've also seen a lot of research being done on nuclear energy, hydrogen, electrification in Korea, where we can all work together. So as we enter the age of the fourth industrial revolution, as they call it, I'm very excited to see our region and Korea work together. So I'll stop there and uh, look forward to this panel discussion. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Commissioner Cho. And I, again, I do want to come back to some of this Absolutely. discussion around economic security and, and the key sort of complementarities that Korea and the United States have with one another. Um, but first, I, I want to turn to uh, Jeff Potter, who's with the uh, Office of Governor Jay Inslee, um, for some remarks on some of the state level uh, initiatives that, that Washington State has. and. Um, what Governor Inslee's office is doing. So. Hey, thank you very much, Council General. Thank you for being here, Commissioner. Um, to my fellow panelists as well, and to all of you. Um, uh, greetings from Governor Inslee. Um, I hope that uh, this picture you see here of the group that's assembled is a sign of how important the relationship between the Republic of Korea and Washington State um, really is. You can be, it can be defined in numbers somewhat um, by the level of trade between our two economies. But this is a deeper and much more frequent, much more historical relationship. Um, and I think that's one thing I want to leave with the group is a sense of um, just how much is, is happening day in and day out, and how deep and robust this relationship is. Um, Korea was one of the first places that Governor Inslee traveled um, when he became um, when he became governor, in terms of outbound international travel, um, in 2015, um, his second trade mission uh, went to Korea, um, and really from the beginning, that relationship was something that defined our state's international presence. You know, last year we just had the opportunity to celebrate uh, the 25th anniversary of our sister state relationship with Joe Bokdo. Um, and this is a great example of how that relationship is robust and frequent. Um, you know, Joel Bukto is unique in that they have a uh, office here in Washington State that um, every day is thinking about how we deepen that relationship and chart, chart the future. Um, they're based out at Pierce College in Pierce County, um, which I think speaks to an important function of what the state does in the international arena. You know, we have um, such a robust port network, um, left by the Port of Seattle, to the Port of Tacoma. Um, we have, obviously, Western Washington, Pierce King, Snohomish region, um, which is an enormous driver of uh, economic activity and technology. Uh, but part of our function as a state is to make sure that the full picture of Washington state is represented internationally and in each of the relationships that, that we have. Um, Korea is a great example of how that works. Um, obviously, we're a major source of uh, agriculture export. 
um, but technology export, whether it's manufactured items or tech or some of the other categories that, that we discussed here. Um, but I think I want to take a little bit of time here to talk about using the, the pandemic that the commissioner described as a black light as sort of a, a mark in time about what we've done and how we've done it and how we might, you know, uh, look at this international leadership over the next 10 years and beyond what we want to accomplish with what a state can do um, in an era where, frankly, the kind of relationships we have with a country like Korea help support the overall national objectives um, of the United States. We believe in, in Olympia and the governor's office in Washington State that um, states play a, a really important role, even if foreign policy is entrusted with with national governments. Um, and the crux of this is this relationship of science and technology as a, as a vehicle or focus for, for diplomacy. Um, coming up to this point, let's just say prior to the pandemic, um, we've seen a lot of fruit come out of that, that scientific relationship between Washington State uh, and Japan, excuse me, Korea. The reason that I highlighted um, the governor's visit to Korea in 2015 is because coming out of that within the span of a year or so um, was uh, an agreement between Washington State and uh, Tucson to establish a, a grid partnership. And in fact, that led to economic investment in Snohomish County um, by the acquisition of a company called One Energy. Um, one of the things that we're really focused on in the relationship is as um, detailed and historic as the one we have with Korea is um, not just cultural partnership, not just economic partnership, that's all important, but real concrete um, objectives that advance both regions or both entities' economies, um, that build the day-to-day -day engagement back and forth, and that lead to meaningful outlook because we don't look at these relationships as a luxury, we don't look at them as sort of a uh, side engagement to our day-to-day -day activity. There is a direct connection between the objectives we want to meet domestically, uh, particularly in the space of climate change, clean tech, reducing our emissions, and our international presence. We can't do one without the other. We do not have all the tools here in the United States, um, nor I would dare say in Korea or any one country, to get this done alone. Um, and though the pandemic was a period of time that, as we all know, saw dramatic uh, fall offs in international travel, international exchange, international trade. Um, we have kept that spirit alive. We've kept those engagements alive. Um, one of the things that we're proud about is that when we, um, when Governor Inslee led a delegation to COP26 in Scotland last year, um, we were able to um, launch an engagement with 68 subnational governments. Um, to focus on low carbon construction and built environment um, tech. Several Korean uh, jurisdictions, including uh, Jeju province, um, was, was part of that. Um, we too are uh, going to COP27, excited to help lead sort of the state delegation that'll be happening in the second week um, and uh, talking with other partners in in South Korea, including Jeju, but also Chungnam and others about uh, what we might be able to do to further our ambitions in this space. And this is a really important part of the question that was asked sort of the props for this activity about you know, what can states do to um, advance science and tech as a, as a means of diplomacy. Uh, we have long viewed, as I think this group knows, like I said, um, that states have a role in pushing the United States to live up to some of our commitments and values um, internationally. In this conversation, that's you know principally in the context, and I think most noticeably in the context of confronting climate change. But it's it's not alone. It's meeting our commitments to shared defense of democracy, to um, shared partnerships in support of uh, immigration and academic freedom and things like that. Um, but whether it was states coming together as part of the U.S. Climate Alliance to make sure the U.S. kept up with its commitments to the Paris Accords over the last decade, or now where uh, we are raised, helping to raise the salience of subnational governments to 
go further, farther, and faster with their commitments under Paris Accord, under other um, international engagements in this space. This is something that we're not just saying, oh, we're doing it, you know, meets with something we're already doing. It's a proactive step um, that could, we mean to advance the conversation, that we mean to um, let people know, hey, you're not quite there. We need to get faster to keep to 1.5, to keep to 2. Jennifer spoke eloquently about how much work we have left to do. And as long as this governor is in office, if we can here in Washington State, continuing to work with any partner that shares that view, that we have to develop the science and technology, the tools, and share those tools to keep our emissions aligned um, with the prospect of a livable planet. Um, some of the things I'd add to uh, what the commissioner talked about are some of the recent partnerships. Um, and COSME is doing that work not just here, but we're also excited that um, they'll be uh, opening a center in Snohomish County as well. Um, the Washington Technology um, Industry Association, I believe it is, um, is doing a similar project to bring some business engagement over here in the broadband space. And I would say one of the things that we're most proud of in the, in the coming months and years, we've launched it last year, is what we call our Innovation Cluster Accelerator um, Program. And the Clean Tech Alliance is an important, um, actually a vital partner in not just the program overall, but some of the key uh, clusters that we're working to develop. We have nine of them, but some of the key ones for this conversation are sustainable aviation, clean tech in general, um, and then um, ICT, as was mentioned earlier in the course of the conversation. This is a unique program for us, not only because it's developing these industries at a statewide level, statewide range. Um, we recently went on a mission with Rochelle, um, a Jennifer's colleague, as well as Commissioner Calkin from the commission um, to the Nordic countries where the representatives who joined us from the Clean Tech Alliance were actually from Spokane, from other parts of the state. Um, we're investing in this not just because we need those industries that we're developing, but because the partnership of driving the construction of key industries that will define the future of coming decades uh, binds us together with France, binds us together with Norway, binds us together with Korea. Uh, it's a model that, that is kind of uh, shared, it gives us shared interest and shared commonality. And I think that'll be you know, pretty key as we go forward in this era that was described at the top of the conversation about as the world moves in directions where autocracy and democracy are being more defined, where that's having economic um, outputs, how do we partner with our friends? How do we partner with our allies? How do we make that imbalance between the security and economic relationship um, that the commissioner talked about um, work more in our favor? So I'll just close here a little bit about what we're trying to do going forward and what we wanted to have to find the rest of the 2020s and into the 2030s. Um, I think if if I have my way and if the governor has his way and, and things work out, what you'll see is a um, economic engagement, international related engagement um, that grows in robustness over time that you know inhabits these shared values and promotes them even as we do the day-to-day -day work of engaging on, on trade, um, shared cultural engagements. Um, and there's not a country better um, positioned, better equipped that, that we're more excited about to be a partner in that than the Republic of Korea. Um, again, both because of the historic nature of our relationship and the, the shared possibility. And you, know, you see this in all the areas the Council General described, but. I'm particularly thinking about engagement around high speed rail, around wind, around, um, yes, potentially hydrogen and other alternative energy sources, uh, potentially including nuclear. Um, our view is that Washington State as a state can help raise the level of ambition here at home and abroad, um, but we will need these partnerships with countries of shared values and shared interests to really push the envelope. And so as we talk a little bit more, I think we can talk about some of the ways that we're doing that, but what I hope everyone will hear from us is um, share, uh, shared ambition, shared ambition for more and a willingness to put the shoulder of the wheel to borrow a phrase from the governor to get that done. So thanks for the opportunity to be here today and look forward to the rest of the conversation.
Excellent. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, well said. Partners and shared values, I think, is something that we're really we're really looking at. Um, important work here, and we've been uh, we've been circumventing uh, a very important part that I want to move to with our last speaker. Uh, an important part of this puzzle with uh, Mr. Ian Oates from the University of Washington is going to talk a little bit about the role for academia in this vital relationship that we have. So, Ian. Thanks, Tom. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Ian Oates, Associate Director of the uh, Center for Korea Studies at the University of Washington. Uh, thank you for being here this morning. Thank you all for being here in person and online. Um, I want to begin by giving us a little bit of, like Sam, historical context <laughs> on this. Um, now, uh, truism by all historians is it happened earlier and it was much more complicated, but uh, we'll, give, we'll give us a good start date here. Um, and I really want to focus on the evolution of the United States and Korea's relationship in academia and education more broadly. And really that began with the Terman Report in the late 1960s and early 1970s and the founding of the uh, Korean Academy or Institute, uh, Korean Advanced Institute of Science, which today now is KAISC, KAIST, uh, they had technology, KLM. So this was an initiative that was started by uh, U.S. diplomatic representatives, private uh, business partners in Korea, and some academics in Korea as well through USAID to establish an institute to truly focus on homegrown uh, science and technology development. Uh, first started with uh, just the Korean Institute of Science and Technology in 1966, again, with aid from the United States government to help develop this institution, and then would evolve with, through the Terman Report into uh, KAIST by 1970-1971. Now, this institution is incredibly relevant because where Korea had plenty of different uh, private ventures, there was no formal academic training in Korea to establish homegrown scholars moving forward in these fields, and that's what KAIST really uh, came to do, or the Terman Report came to play. Now, when we're looking at what education would for looked like previously in academia, it was all very much a foreign bound mission. If you wanted to train scholars and high-end engineers, uh, et cetera, the large majority went to the United States and Europe for their training. And what the term report cites, many of those scholars would not come back. It became all the brain grain system trying to get that academic training, which naturally when you have a country in the height of its economic development, you need those minds to come back to help innovate and spearhead all that development going forward. Now, the government had tried different, uh, different objectives, but it was just too expensive. Again, in the late set, the early 60s and the late 70s there were huge changes in Korea. And the economy, politics, everything was a little bit more tumultuous than things are these days, but it really did help set the foundation for success that we go into into the day. Which heist has functioned, thusly training some of the best and brightest engineers, scholars of technology, and beyond. Coming more into the four, and I want to shift slightly from the foundings in academia to really understand the U.S. Korean relationship like Sam had expanded on, uh, really to say where this all came from. Again, with the Korean War and all the <laughs> through, uh, Cold War era, military industrial complex type technologies, and through various exchanges between USAID, the State Department, and their Korean diplomatic counterparts. Um, a lot of this really came around uh, Korea's involvement in the Vietnam, uh, conflict in Vietnam with the United States, and all of the technology exchanges that happened there. Looking at the consumer sector, and this is relevant because academia is deeply entrenched here, and through the uh, process of development of Korea's technological innovation, and it, we really need to understand where Korea started at and where they, uh, where they continued from. Very much modeling what Japan had done. Similarly, we start with simple consumer products, look at radios, televisions, etc. Then you go into more complex technologies, what we see today personal computers, semiconductors, microprocessors, beyond. Um, as uh, Scott Lin Su Kim is very clear in his invitation to innovation, Korea started copying, but has now very clearly entered innovation in full competition with their partners and allies, the US being the principal one in the past. This comes back into education, as many scholars have explored, Korea's success is really based in education, not only in the academy, but from the ground up process. Uh, Korea having one of, although controversial at times, the best public edu education systems on earth. 
Korea is one of the most highly educated societies on earth. And you can see that in how the economy continues to grow, how the um, people continue to innovate in science and technology and beyond. Now, where it's complicated with coming back into academia is really where our relationship and the exchange between science and technology scholars between Korea and the U.S. exists. Um, there are highlights of successes. Uh, prime example, the University of Washington's uh, Professor Yip Che, uh, just a few weeks back was awarded uh, the Mark one of the Mark Adams Foundation's Genius Grants. So there's a lot of success, particularly here in the state of Washington. But it's complicated, and I want to speak briefly on education and the academy as a source, a uh, site of diplomacy. It's in principally important. Now, uh, science and technology training has obviously permeated uh, South Korean, South Korean education system from primary school onwards, and our linkages between Korea and the U.S. are very pronounced. Uh, you know, again, I'm going to come back to UW as an example, my place I know best. Um, currently, we hold exchange agreements with Seoul National University, Yonsei, uh, Korea University, KAIST itself, uh, Sungung Kwan University, and this list is expanding every year. Um, our research partnerships <coughs> from scholar to scholar exchanges from UW scholars and scholars at a variety of institutions in Korea with over 2,500 different publications from 100 different institutions in Korea. Uh, even one of our uh, departments that we work with directly with Center of Korea Studies, uh, Asian Languages and Literature, we're expanding so much because so many students are so interested in Korea, we're adding new full-time uh, teaching professors both in languages and another full-time professor in uh, cultural media exchange. Now, these relationships aren't necessarily perfect. We're dealing, we're looking at a position where Korea is much stronger here than we are in the United States, uh, and a lot of it's based on language training. When you're a scholar of any caliber, you're dealing with a high and technical language, but particularly when we're looking at science and technology, it's almost as though you're speaking another language in your native tongue. Korea's fantastic at this. You have English language training from five years old moving forward, but the United States is not as well. Where Korean scholars can more comfortably come to the United States, work with their colleagues here, and uh, commit to full exchanges, the reverse is less so. This is a serious point of growth that we've been working on. It's really focusing on better language training here in the U.S. for us to engage better abroad. Uh, now, again, we're not entirely focused just on science and technology, but the academy is a leading place where we can move forward and where these relationships really now started. Uh, from earlier exchanges in our diplomatic realm with, uh, between the Peace Corps, which helped foster a lot of medical technologies in Korea, uh, to what we see with the Fulbright programs, both U.S.-based Fulbright and Korean Fulbright in our scholarly exchanges and the exchanges between students. Uh, Korea's initiatives, especially the Ground Up Initiative, with their uh, epic teaching programs, really giving the ability to have uh, young professionals in the United States engage as diplomats in Korea and must learn from Korea to bring back to the U.S. The opportunities are there. The relationships are perfect. We have plenty of work to do, but to model these for other countries and learning how academia can be a place of diplomacy, the United States and Korea's relationship mm -hmm. is without a doubt one of the best. It's an excellent note to end on. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, and in absentia, thank you again to uh, C.D. Seo, who has just had to, had to make her exit. Um, at this point in the program, we're going to transition to a little bit more um, engagement. I'm going to have I have a couple of questions I want to ask and take the prerogative of our um, panelists, and I may also migrate up um, to to the front here. Um, but we do also want to take a chance to have a chance to engage with all of you, uh, both online and in person. Um, in person, it's significantly easier. Um, you can just let me know, and I will I will do my best to call on you in, in the order in which I find you. Um, but for our online participants, um, you can work through the WebEx platform with our online moderator, Chihiro Aita, who will be uh, funneling those questions, and um, we'll take your questions once uh, we sort out the order in which we'll do those. So I'm going to move very briefly to the um, And I did want to maybe spark a reverse order, Ian, pick on you, um, because I was... I was really intrigued by the way that you described the relationship between Korea and the United States as in this, in this academic space, as 
vitally important, but also it has there are some bumps in the road, right? So I, I wonder if you could maybe uh, give a, maybe a few examples. Um, I know that your experience at you know this, the pre studies at, at UW is is um, not as science and technology focused, but um, oftentimes these can be issues that that come up. And I might also turn to Jennifer here soon for the relationship between an academic researcher turning an idea into a company, essentially, or a product. So I'll I might turn to Ian first, and I may pass over here. So certainly. So the University of Washington is a public school. Adds even more complications to the right. uh, Now, if you're looking at it from a U.S. boundary, a U.S. station uh, academic, trying to translate a lot of your academic ideas into the private sector, that's not necessarily the mission. But mm -hmm. to do so, there are opportunities there, um, particularly uh, as Sam had highlighted. Uh, if you're working with Korea, uh, the you know, Korean government supported uh, Korean startup institution here in, uh, here in Washington. Now, in Korea, it's similar. You have the opportunity to take your ideas and turn them into the private sector, but a lot, again, especially at the University of Washington, we're a research office. We want to be furthering the ideas that people can then learn from to pursue entrepreneurship. Uh, <clears throat> making the true translational step is if an academic wanted to shift from the academy into the private sector. It's an area for improvement, but often where it comes from is an entrepreneur connecting themselves with that academic, which particularly the UW's business school and our uh, global relations office do a fantastic job of doing, really connecting scholars with these big ideas with uh, private institutions, and uh, particularly because Microsoft is so involved with us on campus, uh, the Gates family has invested heavily in the University of Washington. We have some intrinsic relationships with those who support what we do in research, which then allows those relationships to expand. Um, Jennifer, I don't know if you might have some thoughts on on maybe where where we transition from you know, academia and move into more of the clean tech alliance space. Sure. So I think you know that. That valley of death uh, mm -hmm. chart I, I showed before um, shows how important it is to have support at each step of the process. And I think if we take a step back um, and think about scaling technology, especially for climate tech, it's often you know hardware instead of software, and and so it it can it can be a clunkier process in the sense that it takes longer, it takes more investment, um, it's harder to scale quickly. And so I think um, government funding is really key to have at kind of the intersection of, um, you know, we start with university research, but then um, if we look at moving things along the line, whether it be from early stage accelerator programs and then Move, moving along from there, I mean, the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, $369 billion that was announced in, what was this, August? I mean, it's just a few months back. The, the implications that will have, I think, at every step of the trajectory will be, be huge, and I think it will motivate um, Hopefully, more, even you know, if we're looking at talent pipeline, more students to enter enter the field. I think you know, workforce development is, is really an important topic to us, and a lot of companies in our membership. It's a bit of a tangent, but they have hundreds of job openings that they can't fill, and and their HR directors are coming to our workforce development manager and saying, "Where do we find?" Where do you find these people, right? And so, you know, for these companies that have success, and once the products get launched, I mean, we need to look, we need to actually, we're talking about educational models, go back to middle school. I mean, that's where attrition and, you know, women in STEM, for example, I mean, it's happening at middle school. This is not, oh, well, who's being involved at the college level? And so when we look at in academia and who's entering it and you know, diversity, and um, it, it actually starts very early on where we need to be investing time and so that people are entering the field and we have enough researchers that um so that so we can we can scale 
Oh, uh, I mean, you know, I think when it comes to academia and exchange and we of, of ideas and research, there's a natural tension, right? And you actually touched upon it earlier because if Korean students are coming here to study, Korea naturally wants to bring them back. But if Korean students are coming here to study, we want them to stay, right? Exactly. So there is tension there. Absolutely. So to your question about how can we smooth out some of the imperfections, if the economic relationship between South Korea and our country uh, becomes stronger, then it won't matter. Because if you're um, a, a tech innovator and you're South Korean, you're educated and you do but you went back to Korea, let's say, and started a startup company, organizations like Cosme, who are trying to bring those startups and penetrate the U.S. market, right? At the end of the day, we're breaking down the barriers that will eventually create this free flow of innovation exchange between the two countries to a point where hopefully this tension between who's going to keep the bright mind right. won't matter. Absolutely. Right? And so I think that is the ultimate goal, at least in academia, for us to get to when it comes to U.S. economic ties is, is we are so joined to the hip that it doesn't really even matter if you're in Korea, especially in a post-COVID world, like who cares where we are, right? We've got people online right now, right, joining us, right? It doesn't really matter geographically anymore where you are, uh, as long as the innovation stays, right? And so I think that's the ultimate goal and, and the ultimate kind of key to the, or the, to, to, to the puzzle here. And if I may, I think the piece that's been missing a, a little bit, and here is where I'm gonna take an opportunity to crow on behalf of the state a little bit, um, we are in a unique moment because of the amount of investment that the United States government has made, both in the clean tech and related space, but also in the semiconductor space at the same time. Um, but also with the United States government, frankly, getting off the mat and saying, hey, we want to build some of these, we want to build some of these industries and build some of this capacity um, in the shared democratic space. I, I think. This is the crowing part, you know, over the last 10 years, our state has not been afraid with the means that we have at our disposal. And others have mentioned the clean energy fund um, to say, well, we're going to go build those wind industries. We're going to go build those green industries. We're going to go build those those battery industries. Um, if we lacked the scale that the national government is able to do, whether it's the United States or Korea, um, we've had the wherewithal uh, to say, hey, we're going to commit to developing this here and build partnerships through that. Clean Tech Alliance, the Ford University have all been partners in doing that domestically. Now the United States government is coming here to um, learn how to stand up that kind of approach at national level. I'm reminded of what you heard saying about the Valley of Death phrase, it reminds me of the meeting I had two months ago with the Office of Clean Energy Demonstration at the Department of Energy, where they were essentially like, hey, we're just learning this development cycle with valleys of death, you know, where can we go back and forth and, and learn from all that? So, you know, we in our state, um, and I know we've talked with Korean um, firms about this, you know, we've had the resources, we have enormous hydropower, we have enormous water, we have you know, relatively cheap carbon-free energy even before we, you know, bring online the scale of wind and solar and other that we're trying to do. But I think that direction and demand signal at a national level changes the game. And this partnership between Washington and South Korea, between the United States and South Korea, is such an important part of realizing the potential. And we cannot do it. If we don't do it, we're in real trouble. Three different scores. If I may, really quickly, and Jennifer highlighted a very important point that the U.S. really needs to work on, and that is education. Mm -hmm. Like she said, middle school is where a lot of paths are made and broken for made or broken for a lot of students. And this is something that we can learn from Korea on, really, um, because how Korea respects not only their students but their teachers is principally important to be able to have a well-educated driven workforce that, frankly, in the United States, we have some serious work to do. And Korea Works is a great model, not only in respect, but frankly, if we're looking at this very economically, which we are, compensation. We need to treat our teachers better, like Korea treats their, here, here.
Thank you, Ian. That's and thank you all. That was, um, I think, an excellent, an excellent series. I might have one more question, but um, welcome. Any uh, any sort of brewing thoughts from our in person or uh, online participants? Um, I might sort of a, a year ago. This was the elephant in the room, um, and thankfully, it has become less of an elephant in the room. But um, I wondered if I could maybe start with Sam and maybe move through our other. Uh, participants on uh, you mentioned this and I'm going to steal this uh, okay. but but COVID as a black light mm -hmm. um, and what has been exposed by that you know global pandemic um, I think there are maybe some other flashlights that we might touch on um, you know, energy security and economic security but um, I guess I might, I might start with what has COVID how has it affected you and the work that you do and um, what might what might the ways that, because it was such an impact on international cooperation, international movement, um, but also changed the way we communicate with each other. Um, how has that changed the work that you do and um, the prospect? <laughs> <laughs> Where do I begin? <laughs> uh, so, you know, uh, obviously during the pandemic, uh, we had a lot of disruption, right? Especially within our supply chain. I think the the genesis of all this was that as we were quarantined and we were dealing with this pandemic, a lot of the behaviors of everyday people changed, right? Um, we were staying at home. We weren't going out as much. We were utilizing webcams and cameras and microphones, right, a lot more than before. Uh, and so we saw a huge demand in chips and imported goods from Asia. Um, and I think what, 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 what COVID did is it amplified just how exposed the U.S. supply chain is uh, and, I, and I want to preface this by saying that I'm not against globalization, but the fact is that for so many years, we've outsourced our supply chain to other countries, including South Korea, China, Japan, right? And when there was a huge influx of demand for chips in, in, in electronics and other goods from Asia, there was the, the infrastructure at ports uh, and all across the logistical supply chain couldn't handle that volume. That's why you read about the 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 vessels sitting outside the port of uh, Long Beach and the port of Seattle, right, and all and all the West Coast ports, because we had such a crazy influx of demand for all these goods coming from Asia, um, and obviously it was a huge eye opener for everyone, not just in the logistics and supply chain industry, but also the technology, uh, the Biden White House, and and even the Trump administration had to figure out ways to try and smooth out those that disruption, and so as a result of that. Uh, like I said earlier, we are this administration and many people in the port and logistics and trade industry are very focused on economic security. The idea that we need to make sure that in uh, instances of disruption, like a pandemic or war, even right, that we are secure, uh, not just militarily, but militarily, but also economically. And that has opened up the discussion that we are we are having today uh, around. Okay, how can we? Um, secure ourselves economically. And I think this, this conversation is so appropriate because again, to my point about academia and smoothing out some of the bumps between the two countries, it's also relevant in technology and clean tech and in supply chain. Uh, you know, I mentioned in my remarks, uh, the second largest EV market share in this country belongs to Hyundai. I mentioned that, uh, you know, Samsung, you know, you're either an iPhone or a Samsung phone, right? <laughs> That's, I mean, Quite frankly, the, the synergy between the connection between these countries is so strong. Um, and the U.S. is working so far to uh, not necessarily roll back uh, globalization or outsourcing, but I do believe that with the fourth industrial uh, revolution with AI automation, we're going to go through a period of what's called reshoring, which means a lot of the manufacturing that was outsourced to places like South Korea, Vietnam, China, will actually come back. Because the because uh, of automation and a lot of I mean it's already happening. Um, SK has a huge facility in in Georgia, right? Samsung's building a facility facility in Texas, I believe, right? And so a lot of the companies that are uh, leaders in technology are actually looking for ways to reshore a lot of those jobs back to the U.S. And I think it's a golden opportunity for our state. Right, as a, especially in the sustainability space, to kind of capture some of that market share in terms of reshoring, um, and you know, obviously, it's opened up in a lot of opportunities for the Port of Seattle. 
because as LA Long Beach, I don't know if you know this, but uh, the, the largest Korean population is in LA, in the South Southern California. So a lot of Korean businesses gravitate towards that area for business because they, the community, the culture is there, right? But what happened during the pandemic was LA Long Beach was so congested, congested that it actually gave us an opportunity to go out and take market shares in LA Long Beach, right? And say, hey, there's a hundred ships uh, outside LA Long Beach. There's like 30 or 40 ships out here. You have, you have a better sh shot of unloading a container faster in Seattle Tacoma than you do in LA Long Beach. And so it's been kind of a, a, a perfect storm, but I always say where there's disruption, there's opportunity. And I'm really, really bullish about kind of this relationship going forward. Um, I might I might reverse the yes now. Um, and uh, Jeff, I know that you're um, you've been working with you know Governor Inslee in the Office of International Relations, and and any any thoughts on how COVID impacted uh, the, the the stance or yeah I mean I, I think the thing to add about COVID at this stage is it's worth remembering that it was the third big shock in about 10, 15 years. And if it was unquestionably uh, the largest, at least in terms of how many of us it touched, which is basically every single human on the planet, um, you know, let us not forget that we had a massive economic shock in 2008, uh, continued economic shocks in the years following that, um, I'll add the the transition um, to the Trump administration in 2017 to that in terms of the perceptions of U.S. engagement with the rest of the world, um, and then and then COVID-19. So you know you can throw in um, I won't just say the the Russian attack on Ukraine alone into that, but sort of the continuing engage continuing return of direct military coercion as a tool in the international space, because it's not just Ukraine that we're worrying about right now, it's continued confrontation um, coming from North Korea and the threat that that poses to Japan and to Korea, Republic of Korea. Um, I say all this because, quite frankly, we need our friends more, we need our partners more. Um, and this is what I was getting at a little bit in my comments when I said, you know, th this is not a, this kind of engagement is not a luxury. This is not something that, you know, appeals or matters to only a certain small slice of our, of our population. I think one of the numbers that's most useful to look at, I was kind of diminishing numbers earlier, um, but there's some absurd figure that's escaping me, but hundreds of thousands of jobs in this state directly or indirectly dependent directly on trade with somebody. 60%. 60, yeah. thank you. Um, and, and the share of that number, looking at trade with Asian country is a commensurately a large share of that because that's the share of our total trade portfolio overseas. So as, as the pie has shrunk, as the world has become less secure for a host of different reasons, um, Point you were making, Commissioner, is an important one. We we are going to have to share resources, share goods, share means of generating security, economic and otherwise, um, with a with a community of nations that sort of shares our values. Um, so when you talk about how that affects our work, I think you know some of those shocks saw us turning resources away from this kind of international partnership. And I'll get back to it when times are a little bit better. Times are only gonna get better if we have these kind of partnerships. This is why I was hitting on earlier. It's, it's not a luxury. Um, and I do think you see that in sort of the granularity and specificity of, of the relationships we're having. It's not just that we export our agricultural products or import something else. Um, no, we're we're building industries together with our partners um, that we need to preserve the standard of living we understand as the as the modern standard. So I hope that message sinks in with people that the kind of engagement that we're talking about is not optional. It is the key towards 
the future. And um, I think something that uh, Ian was saying earlier, you know, comparing Washington State with Korea, um, we're talking about what we have to learn about the educational model. You know, this is something that we share this kind of highly developed, highly educated, highly productive um, economies and workforces. Um, we need to find ways to continue to leverage leverage that development on both sides because you're not going to make it all at home anymore. It's got to come both sides. Excellent. Um, Jennifer, any, any thoughts on how CTA navigated? Um, pandemic? I know you joined. Uh, I joined really during the pandemic. pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 For someone that, you know, led event programming through a pandemic, it was highly disruptive. I mean, when, when uh, one of the key purposes of the trade association is to bring people together, whether it, whether it be through in person networking events, educational seminars, conferences, trade missions, etc. Um, so I guess I think that was very challenging from a networking aspect. I think from an educational perspective, um, you know, going virtual does allow you to bring in speakers from across the US, from, from Canada. And so we could expand our geographic reach of our membership of having those connections and access. Um, but some of the, you know, the, the networking component can get lost in the virtual aspect. And I think, um, you know, it goes both ways. Obviously, I highlighted, you know, what can we do for our members if international companies are looking to expand the US and have visibility, but both ways, right? So we, you know, all I think knowledge sharing, best practice knowledge sharing is key. And um, what there's a lot of great things happening in the US, but plenty of other countries are are leading with cutting edge technologies. And so um participation in international trade missions, I mean those the dates of those were constantly in flux and getting rescheduled. But when I think about uh what I'm excited as we're sort of entering this quasi post COVID <laughs> phase is, you know, we were on the the Nordic mission with um the innovation cluster accelerator program that's funded by the Washington State Department of Commerce. And my my colleagues did tour, you know, clean tech cluster companies in Finland and um in, in Scandinavia to, to see what they're doing that we're we're not, right? That we're not doing to bring that knowledge back. And then and the same would go with you know Hanover Method in Germany is another international conference that we've attended on behalf with commerce and so i think um while it's been highly disruptive to get people back in person the trend is the trend is going that way and i'm i'm excited um i think with that visibility of being online we we do have new partners um nationally internationally that are have heard about us and um, so we're building a bigger ecosystem um, I might turn to Ian uh, briefly also on how COVID affected UW and, and maybe any any sort of silver linings or anything like that. <laughs> um, there are definitely silver linings, and I I think we'll have uh, Professor Ha maybe add some comments on how difficult it's been as a scholar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the third thing. We're not discussing a lot of pandemic here, right? Mm -hmm. So you must share some learnings with people. Certainly, I'll be brief. Um, I mean, COVID changed everything. I was at when COVID uh, set in. I was still a master's student, and I was TAing courses. And we sent all the students home. Finally, mm -hmm. immediately everything changes. Uh, we're doing remote exams. There was no instantiation of Zoom, anything like that. But really, the silver lining, I suppose, is the forces shift into hybridity. Mm -hmm. uh, everything that we do now has a greater global reach. And now that we're all coming back in person. You are still allowed those interpersonal relationships that you need in face to face while still being able to engage. Excellent. Thank you. And I would like to take the opportunity to open it up to questions um, from the audience. I believe uh, Professor Ha from the University of Washington has uh, a question for our panelists. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this is a very interesting session, uh, frankly. Uh, normally, I don't know that this kind of very I mean, 
no level of uh, discussion in, in terms of, uh, let's say, state, local, federal level. I used to go to federal level discussion, not the uh, local level here. But I learned a great deal from uh, the discussions, particularly in uh, the from the uh, governor's office. I, I learned a great deal from uh, the uh, commissioner, Chong, uh, very dominating discussion. And we said that let me just broaden the perspective a little bit here. There is the, um, we are somehow we have a discussion too much about survival. I mean, economic issues, all this stuff, ecosystem, all this stuff. But then, if we take a more law, historical perspective on South Korea as well, let's say organization, this is really interesting to the United States. Wow. I mean, if you look back, uh, if you look around the world, the countries in the world, which used to be supported by the United States, which country actually has made such a success in South Korea? South Korea is the first country, the most important case, uh, success, successful story of the United States dependency uh, for the last uh, 50 years. Also, South Korea is in, is in clean fourth Cold War Great Britain, in that uh, it first uh, Dualized economic development and democracy as Great Britain did in the West in Europe. In Western Europe. So, I'm trying to highlight the civilizational significance of South Korea's modernization. And we should not forget this. Uh, from that uh, significance, I want to say one more thing that is the, uh, if you look at East Asia or, or even the rest of the world, South Korea is the most West. The most is the tilting toward the West kind of country in the world. South Korean identity has been changing. That's why the Chinese don't understand how, what kind of country South Korea has become. They still maintain historical perspective on South Korea, which is, is not true, which is, which is very well. Okay? I think we should realize this importance of South Korea case. Uh, so from that, we should derive the value consensus between South Korea and the United States. To me, this is a really important uh, uh, aspect uh, to US-South Korea relations. But having said that, uh, coming down to more specific level of uh, survival issue, I, I foresee a lot of trouble there uh, in, in us foreign relations. Why? If you look at what's going on in, in the United States, during the Cold War, when the uh, South Korea was uh, was realizing a kind of success, due to the open access to U.S. market, now if this seems U.S. market will be narrow and narrow to to South Korean product. Uh, the why? Because as the late the Professor Chan Johnson said, the only sector in the United States which is similar to Japan, Japanese system used to be U.S. Now. As uh, the Jennifer said, uh, this is billions, billion dollars now pouring into private sector. What kind of economic system is is the United States uh, will, uh, will be uh, uh, will will the United States economic system look like in, in the near future? To me, that's really concerning. Okay. More more of the mercantilistic, if not nationalistic, kind of approach to what well, well, as the Sam said, the reshoring strategy. What what would be implications of this? For uh, U.S. South relations, I foresee a lot of conflict between military security and then economic security in the years to come. And then, having said that, uh, the, I want to ask uh, the the governors, uh, the uh, the staff, the uh, ACA. Now, at the national level, federal level, a lot of change going on. And what is what 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 impact would it have on at local level uh, in terms of uh, state level government? And then the local business, for example. Uh, I just want to ask you a particular question. And then uh, here, the whole discussion uh, I'm listening to, I see different levels here. I see state level, for example, level, uh, and the academic level. And I don't see any coherence here, frankly. I mean, the, that's why the America probably in trouble. How to coordinate uh, these different levels of activity into one? Or any coherent policy. That's uh, my last comment. But to the Korean side, uh, whenever I read the the, the, um, the Korean newspapers, what I found so fascinating is that 
Well, that happens uh, politically in, in U.S. state. Mm. They say, uh, they say Washington State. Where is Washington State in the newspaper? I never see. Uh, Frank. Right? So uh, I think the other side should work harder. Even even within America, I don't know much about the southern part of America, Frank. But to to most Korea, they, they only know Seattle, New York, uh, Shanghai. I mean, uh, San Francisco. That's about it, right? So uh, the, I think Koreans should work, work harder. They only come to Washington DC for quality, quality discussion. They never visit, they seldom visit Seattle or even some other cities for discussion. Mm -hmm. So I really alert the South Korean side to pay more attention to what is really going on. Yeah. At the state level, more or local level. I mean, I mean otherwise, uh, there's a Jennifer's work. Uh, actually, if that happens, Jennifer's work would be much more facilitated by this kind of uh, more close attention to the state and local issues in America. Thank you very much, Professor Hall, for those, those excellent remarks. I want to give our panelists a chance to respond. You might start with uh, Jeff on that. Um, well, I think there's a connection between the, the comment you made and the question you asked, which is boiled down to that's sort of the choice, right? There's nothing. There's nothing necessarily that forces a country like the United States to close its doors, to break connections, to disconnect from its international neighbors. That is not a requirement of building up domestic industries of concern. At the same time, I think we, frankly, as a country, have a, um, a habit and a risk of, of falling into that trap. I think. Some of what a state like ours has the opportunity to do is make those connections without um, without make those connections in a way that actually opens doors rather rather than closes them. Um, you know, we've been engaging in that kind of diplomacy, and I'll give you I'll give you one example of what we're working on here. Is may know. Um, Washington State recently passed at the legislative level um, a carbon trading market to actually reduce emissions in the context of our Climate Commitment Act. Um, there is not a market here in the United States for that, with the exception of California. So we are partnering with Quebec well, in California. We are partnering with Manitoba and California. We're partnering with New Zealand um, and those other jurisdictions. And that's not just a memorandum of understanding or a, or a shared visit. All those things matter, but this is something that's creating a, a bond across oceans, across geographies, to actually do something and create an economic unit of partnership. So on the one hand, we're you know, developing our own domestic industries that will benefit from the investment this will generate, but we're not doing it by sticking just inside the boundaries of the U.S. Um, we're going outside of the U.S. I hope... I think is our objective, but this is one example of how we're going to add four or five or six or seven other jurisdictions um, to a concrete partnership. Um, we frankly share the view that the Commerce Department, the State Department, here I'm referring to the federal entities, um, more coordination would be great. This is what I was referring to when I said the United States has gotten into the game very late. Um, we have a robust U.S. commercial service and trade partnership and all that, but um, quite frankly, we agree that it leaves a lot of opportunity um, on the table. And I think this is the difference between what uh, what has happened in years past and what needs to happen going forward is that states can be part of shaping the opportunity picture rather than have it being done, you know, from the Reagan building in DC. Those folks are great, but it's gotta be a two-way street. Historically, it hasn't. We're gonna do our part at least to make sure that's more the picture going forward. I know we're running a little short on time, but I do wanna give our other panelists a chance to maybe respond to uh, the overall picture of where the United States is going and how that might interact with science and tech diplomacy with a key partner like Korea. So things like the Inflation Reduction Act and the Chips and Science Act that are at the federal level, how are those um, manifesting uh, in your space? And 
where do you see sort of the relationships going forward? So, Sam, well, as you all know, there's a tremendous amount of money being pumped into uh, government spending, the Inflation Reduction Act, the, uh, the Inflation Share uh, Bill, or the bipartisan infrastructure law, is what they're calling these days. Um, and so, there's a lot of funding, federal funding out there. And the question is, how will that trickle down? And then how will that affect a lot of the things that we just talked about today, especially in sustainability, technology? A lot of that money needs to be spent on that technology and innovation. And Professor Ha mentioned, you know, a lot of these conversations happen at the 10,000 foot level on the federal level. But what I would say is that uh, the benefit and the advantage of local level is that we are far, we are more nimble. We can do what we're more agile, and we can get things done faster than perhaps even the federal level. In fact, you know, I used to work in DC, and I used to think federal level was the be all end all, right? Uh, but I, I quickly learned when I returned to Seattle that oh wow, you can actually uh, do a lot on the local level faster, right? And the beauty of that is that a lot of the stuff you see on the federal level was actually experimented and piloted on a local level and brought to the federal level. A lot of our members of Congress, uh, a lot of our policymakers talk to us, right? The governor's office, port commissioners. We meet with them regularly and we say, and they ask us, what are you doing at the Port of Seattle that we can scale to the national level, right? And so uh, we have those conversations all the time. Oh, green corridor between Busan and Seattle. We should have that. A green corridor between the United States and Korea, right? And so what I'm hopeful for and hopefully uh, we'll leave you with this, this, um, this, the fact that on the local level, on the state level, we can experiment, we can be innovative, and then hopefully we'll get to a point where we can scale that on a national level to the, the U.S. and South Korea deepen their relationship. So I'll, I'll leave that. Uh, sure, sure. Well, the Jennifer Blast Looking at current U.S. government policies and the reality of the I'll, I'll be frank, lagging. <laughs> Pretty heavily. Um, again, us is a uh, public institution under the state of Washington. It's a very state by state case, but as we all know funding for public uh, public education in the United States has done nothing but got that. Uh, so we would love further support from the Biden administration, administrations in the future to help chart strong, particularly international programming, uh, because they're on the decline in what our government tries to support now. That being said, one interesting policy decision that we'll see what the effects end up being that is supporting students at least, or former students, is uh, President Biden's student debt relief plan. We'll see what those effects would truly be if we can call it support or otherwise, but as we all know is how intensely deadly students are in the United States. It might be a step from right forward, but we do really need to think about the economics of education from how we're funded and how we can support students in gaining that. And um, Jennifer? Sure, I, I have all the sentiments, so I'll, I'll keep it brief, but I think going back to this idea of um, starting small rather than waiting for things to move forward at the federal level, um, I was at the Cascadia Innovation Quarter Conference about a month ago where Bill Gates and Brad Smith and a a lot of your speakers spoke about climate change and, and the region. And um, part of that Cascade Innovation Quarter concept is actually, you know, we can move things forward faster to achieve the net zero goal of bringing in British Columbia, Washington State, Oregon. And they invited, um, you know, Governor Gavin Newsom to join the this group of four speakers as well with Premier Morgan and, and the West Coast governors, because I think the there's an acknowledgement that the West Coast can move faster than, than waiting for the rest of the country maybe to, to catch up. And so I think when we talk about, you know, establishing green corridors, um, we can do best, best practice sharing with bring in a few states or bring in a few provinces or, you know, one, you know, a region in Korea with a region in the U.S. I think um, it, we can just move quicker than if you wait. That's excellent. And I know that we are we are just about at time. Um, so if you did have any questions um, for in-person participants, we'll be moving uh, to a networking lunch just after this. But I'm going to turn over to my uh, distinguished supervisor, Ashley Johnson, the Senior Director of MJ Environmental Affairs, to close this out. Thank you um, for that. And one, just I hope you'll join me all in thanking uh, our panelists CG Seo, who I know had to leave, but um, we'll start with just a thank you 
to you all for, for being here, for sharing your thoughts. And I have a few more comments, so I hope you'll join me in thanking them for your, your expertise on this session. So very grateful to have you here. I would like to think as, as we, this is not the last in this kind of series of discussion. We are really interested in this way that we can cooperate with others at these different levels. I think Dr. Hayi raised a really important question of how can we continue to develop and, and connect and educate ourselves and others at the person to person level, at the city level, at the state level, and in working on things like trade delegations and sister cities and states, and how we might be able to help, you know, connect Georgia and Texas and kind of connect with both states and Korea um, and really continue to develop this relationship. So I hope that um, you will continue to, to join us as we host some similar discussions in the future, um, either here in Seattle. Um, in D.C., online, wherever they might take us um, around the world, but really grateful to have you all here. Um, I hope you will be able to stay and join us for lunch. We have, again, our expert speakers here. All of you are experts, too, in your, your own fields, and so as we continue to have these conversations, um, we have another hour, but there will be food involved, so I think we will be able to continue these conversations, and um, thank you again for being here. We look forward to more conversations.